Hi there, and welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and I get to be here today with Nancy Hicks, who is just an amazing author and speaker and a um, sp former spokesman for QVC. Nancy has been in communication her whole life, and as an on-air spokeswoman for QVC, she inspired millions of viewers to embrace beauty and life. After earning her master in theology, she launched her speaking ministry, Nancy Hicks Live. Nancy has a passion for Christ and is a herald of his call to life. Her mission is to raise up women around the globe by igniting and equipping them and regularly is engaged across the whole media spectrum. You could find her speaking at conferences, on college campuses, on podcasts, at retreats, and radio, TV, social media. She does it all. And if that wasn't enough, she recently released her first book, which is what we're going to be talking about a lot today. It's called Meant to Live, Living in Light of the Good News. And I was just absolutely inspired and excited to read this book. And I'm excited to bring Nancy here to talk with us and to talk to you today. Thank you, Nancy, for being here. Oh, Jamie, it's a complete pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, um, we like to start our interview episodes by asking the same question. What is your favorite prayer closet? This could be pretty traditional. It could be a room or it could be totally off the wall. Where do you feel closest to God and like to pray? Well, it's funny. I was just writing about this um, in the devotionals that I put out every week, uh, because, but I'm focusing on scripture where people are reading their Bible. But scripture and prayer, they, all, they just go together back and forth. So my favorite place is uh, I have these red velvet chairs. They sit there side by side, these slipper chairs. And right across from them, it's, there's a, a little fireplace area. It's in my dining room, sort of one end of my dining room in my home. And uh, there's a little red couch across from those two slipper chairs. And I sit there and I imagine God sits in the other chair and the other in the other uh, little couch. And that's where I would say, when I'm home and I have my time with God to speak, to pray, to listen, that's where I meet with God most of the time. <laughs> I will be found on the floor as well, getting down on my knees when I just really feel like I got to get down. But, um, and then and I, you know, the practice, practicing the presence of God, uh, like so many people, uh, you pray everywhere, but that's my favorite place. Well, I'm sure traveling, you have yeah. to do the practice of the presence of God on a regular basis, wherever you are. But I love the, like the two way imagery of not just you throwing it out there, but sitting down and actually having a conversation. That's really neat. Um, yeah. Well, so there is so much that I want to talk about in this interview, but I kind of want to go back. The first thing I wanted to talk about was, um, you recently, so how recently did you leave QVC and begin ministry full time? So I left QVC, I guess it's two and a half years ago. Okay. And um, I had started this ministry, Nancy Hicks Live, four years ago. So four years ago, in January, I had graduated from seminary. I was on air with QVC, still working, still ministering um, big time at our church, our local church, while I was in seminary. Then I graduated and continued with seminary, or continued with um, QVC, praying, God, please, please keep me in the marketplace. I wanted to be around non-believers, mm -hmm. and I wanted to uh, be bivocational like the Apostle Paul, where I could work in the marketplace and continue to minister, as I have my whole life. Um, but I've always said to God, speaking of prayer, Oh, every single show, every single meeting. I mean, I'm praying all my way to, to the studio when I was working on air. I, I did it for 10 and a half years with QVC. I'd always say, Lord, I am here by, an, by appointment. And if, the, if and when the appointment ends, I will submit to you and I will go where you want me to go. So um, I did ask God, please, please let me be bivocational. <laughs> I want to keep working here. I loved it there. Um, but after two years of working, building this ministry, um, which again, I started four years ago, um, two years into it, it became evident that if I really want to impact the world and women all around the world for Christ, I was really going to have to just say goodbye to QVC. So that was difficult, but I really sensed God saying, this is it, Nancy, you need to stop that and just full on this. So. <laughs> so 
just as advice for someone going through a difficult decision like this, how, mm. how did you go about discerning? I know sometimes it's easier when what we feel like we're hearing from God is the opposite of what our heart tells us because you wanted to stay, you felt God calling you to go. There's nothing in you that would shift you and it, that wouldn't be your voice telling you to leave, right? Because you knew you wanted to stay. How, what if it had been the opposite? How do you, what advice would you give to us as we go forward making decisions when we're not sure if it's just our heart wanting us to pursue something or if it's God's voice? How do you go about discerning that? It's, it's such an excellent question, Jamie, really. And, and I'm not sure if I caught when you said the opposite of that. So I want to make sure, please, if I'm not answering the question, like you, you push me around a little and I'll go with you. <laughs> but I, I really mean it because this is a very, this is a vital question because I think while I believe with all my heart um, that as we listen to God, as we, we, we're talking, right? Prayer comprises four aspects, right? There are four aspects to prayer. Confession, praise, thanksgiving, and requests. I think a lot of North Americans have reduced, especially in, in the evangelical variety, have reduced prayer to prayer requests. It's a mm -hmm. huge concern, huge. I, I, I touch on it in the book, but the book's not about that. But I most certainly give a nod to that issue. So I do think that, you know, in the fullness of prayer as we meet with God, we are, we are reading the scriptures, we are talking, we're pouring out our hearts to God, unedited, unedited, authentic, honest. He adores us. He loves us. He wants to hear the cries of our hearts. And so I think that's critical. And at the same time, I think that... Um, we also know what's in there. Sometimes we don't want to utter it. Like that's what I mean by unedited, get it out, get it out before mm -hmm. the Lord. Um, so sometimes I just think we play games in prayer. We put on voices, we do all kinds of weird things. To, and I was like, what are you doing? Like, just talk to God. And P.S. And by the way, be quiet and listen. He wants to speak. He wants to speak to us. So I think for me, I knew I had a desire to be at QVC. I knew I loved being on air. I loved everything about it. And if I'm honest, I also knew that when I was praying, I said this, this was a, a few years earlier, um, I had said to God when our younger son was heading off to university, God, I am going to have more time on my hands. Our boys will be gone. We'll be empty nesters. And I am all in for the kingdom. Like, use mm -hmm. me. Spend my life as you will. Okay, so here's the truth. I begin to process with God, to think, to pray, to find out what do I want to do. And a lot of what I wanted to do, to be honest with you, was to do a master's in fashion. And to, because I was an on-air um, style expert for QVC. Mm. I loved doing my fashion. I loved the on-air stuff. It was a blast. However, as I was on the computer looking at masters in fashion at FIT or Parsons in New York, down deep in my soul, Jamie, I could sense the Lord saying, it would be fun, wouldn't it? You'd love it, honey. But that's not what I'm calling you to. Like I sensed, do I want to give my life? And I, listen, God wants his people all over the marketplace, dentists, doctors, teachers, you know, he wants us everywhere. So I think if you feel the sense of God calling you through prayer, calling you to do something like full-time ministry, like don't give up your day job just yet, seriously. It's too many people do that and I don't think it's wise. But I do think through prayer, if there's down deep in your soul, there is nothing I want to devote my time to, nothing I want to, and you're in a, in a position where financially you can, whatever that means, there is nothing I want to talk about more. I don't want to talk about fashion. I want to talk about Jesus. <laughs> I want to talk about life in God. Um, I think um, you have to be real and honest about that. So when God got to the point with me where two years in, it became this crossroad of, do I keep blacking out? I had the, the luxury of getting to black out at QVC days I couldn't work. And they notice. They notice, of course, like, Nancy, you're not here for that. You're in Haiti or you're in the Philippines or you're in India or whatever. Um, you know, it, it, now you're at a crossroads. What do you want to do? What are you going to do? 
And for me, it just became evident, really evident. This is, I have to do this. And let me say this, may I? One more thing about the prayer piece. Oh, yeah. You then start a ministry, right? But it's not easy. And you believe with all your heart, God has been very clear. He has spoken. And God was very clear with me about the calling, what he was calling me to three times in one year. He was very clear. Child, all this communication background is for this. He was mm. so clear. I had written it down. I prayed. I confirmed it with other believers, people that I value, not, not just Christians, wise Christians who I could trust and who knew me and loved me to confirm what God what I believed God was saying, they were confirming it. The scriptures were confirming it. Um, people were affirming my gifting. So, so it's, you know, that answers very succinctly what you asked me. But then you begin. And then there were times where QVC called me back in the two years since I left. <laughs> called me back three times to come back on air. And I sensed the spirit of God. One time I was sitting by a poolside reading, reading stuff, just reading and reading, but I was relaxing in the summer. And as soon as I got off the phone, I sensed the Lord saying to me, you want to go back? And I, I felt like if this is one of those moments, you know, the Luke where Jesus says, anyone who puts their hand to the plow and turns to the left or right is not worthy. He's harsh, not worthy of the kingdom, he says. And I sensed that coming to mind, and I was like, I will not turn back, Abba. I will not turn back. So that is just a life of prayer. That is, I, I, did I answer the question for you, though, Jamie? Oh, absolutely. I thought that was, that was great. Yes, you did. And, yeah, I, I think it's so important what you said about, first of all, being honest, not thinking that we're going to fool God and, and being honest with ourselves as well as him. Yes. And then and being persistent and not jumping the gun. Like you said, don't, don't give up your day job just yes. yet. Yes. Don't be foolish. Press in, you know? keep asking con confirmation by other believers. I love yes. that. But, but the point that, you know, it would be really nice if the struggle to come to a large decision would be the end of it, but you're right. It's not, it's a lifetime of prayer. It's a lifetime of, of, of being, receptive to God. And I just, I think that's another really good point. Don't think that once that decision is made that a, he won't lead you in the other way later, you know, or, okay, well, this door is closed now, so it'll never be open again. I mean, God has seasons in store for us. So, so I loved that encouragement to continue to be open and can, and not to just say, oh, well, they called me back. That must be a sign I'm supposed to go back now. <laughs> right. Especially when it's tough, right? When you right. feel like, wait a minute, <laughs> I was just getting paid a really good salary and yeah. showing up for all these shows yes. and sitting in a makeup chair and getting to wear pretty clothes and be on air, speaking to millions of viewers. That's extremely tempting Yeah. when you're trying to build a ministry and trying to get speaking opportunities and you love to teach the word of God and you love to be live with people. And they're not knocking on your door. Yeah. That's tough. That's humbling. And it is only going to be through prayer. It's only going to be going to be through God and and Nancy or God and whomever linked, completely linked, and my listening to his leadership. Otherwise, I'm gonna throw in the towel and go back. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I you you touched on going out of the country and, and some of this work that took you to different places. I was really curious what you, you seem like you would have a great perspective on this. Um, how have you seen prayer looking different from the West or the United States um, compared to different parts of the world? And then how, what are some common threads? Like what, what have you mm. seen in terms of that? Well, two things come to mind, Jamie. Um, one is I was in Albania uh, a couple years ago, and I was there with um, Media 7, which is the largest uh, Christian media outlet, radio television, in Albania. And now they've expanded into, into Italy, Mesopotamia. Um, they were in Kosovo already at the time when I was there. But so they're, they're you know, across this, this wonderful region where if very, very few resources and believers are at a minimal too. Um, Albania is in fact uh, the only country in the world that had, had self-identified as atheist, 
for, for a long time under communist regime. So in fact, today, they are first generation Christians. Like they don't have a history of Christianity. So I was sitting um, in a meeting with them one day and I was doing a lot of radio television for them and leadership and teaching, et cetera. And I was sitting in a meeting with them one day um, before we got the day going and um, we were praying and we were um, talking about hardships, et cetera. And it was interesting to me as we prayed, they, they're, a lot of times prayer, of course, is, um, is a reflection, yes, of our passion for God, but it's also a reflection of our personalities. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason there are 48,000 denominations of Christianity throughout the globe. There's a reason because we express ourselves differently, you know, and I think that's a beautiful reflection. If we can embrace the differences, a beautiful, beautiful reflection of the Trinity and of God. Um, but what I found in Albania, one of the things that stands out as we pray, quiet, generally quieter prayers, generally, but no less fervent. One thing someone said was, we don't worry about persecution. And trust me, persecution is real. It's a Muslim nation. Um, so persecution could be very, they could drop a bomb on that whole compound where we were, are, this Christian compound, and wipe it out. Oh, but it was funny because as we were talking, they said, we're not worried. We're not worried about persecution. I mean, I know we could die. We know we could die. I thought that was a riveting thing to say. And, and so it's this beauty. And then we're praying with this reality. Sure, we could die, but we're not going to worry about what kind of persecution are you going to fret? Um, we already know that we can die. What more can they do? And so this beautiful, beautiful prayer of that kind of passionate, this juxtaposition of this is the reality of living here and, and doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And this beautiful, simple, frankly, simple, quieter prayers, very real, very fervent. Contrast that with an East Asian country where I ministered, and I have to be careful what I, what I say about which countries, right. but in one country, one country, oh my goodness, on one Sunday, I, I, I spoke and preached 28 times in two weeks, Jamie, in, wow. in this particular country. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. And um, at one point, I was in, on one Sunday, I was preaching in a village, and I was preaching in a house church, and I was preaching in a really large a church in a field. Now it was in a, it was in, a, I think I even mentioned it and I know I mentioned it in the book. Um, but in this one village, this young woman got up, I bet she was 18 years old and she's not the woman I mentioned in the book. She's another woman. And I don't even remember her name. All I know is that woman was praying on behalf of the men and the women in the room and she was she did not stop she was crying out to god it's sort of like more of a pentecostal they're not charismatic if you can picture that just not stopping just weeping and crying out to god for her nation it was i love the diversity it was passionate in a different way it was no less fervent uh, or no more fervent than what I'd heard in Albania. And I think that that, I think that's something we can, we would do well to remember when it comes to praying. Mm -hmm. Am I sitting down? Am I lying down? Am I standing up? Am I running around the room? Am I, <laughs> are my hands in my lap? Are my hands in the air? Are, like, let's not get too twisted and bent over some of these things. I think there's all kinds of ways to look at it and test it. And uh, I think it goes back to being honest about ourselves. Um, for example, if I have a personality that's really, you know, crazy and wild like mine, and uh, I'm at a concert, I'm at a game, and I'm having an awesome time, and I'm praying like, or, and I'm speaking like that, and I'm talking like that, really, really energetically, arms in the air, lots of fervor, but in prayer, I can never let that out. Something's up. Hmm. Something's going on with my relationship with God. Something's blocking me. That's a really, that's a really fascinating point. And something definitely to think about is, you know, to think of the things that, that make you excited and how you respond to those things. And then to see, am I that same way in my relationship with God? Yes. I really love in the book and we'll get into this in a little bit, but you have these four different camps that you draw out in the book. Um, where you just kind of describe these different 
types of Christians, I guess you would call it. But I love the fact that in this book, you, it's, it's not a pointing fingers at this is what's wrong with each of these types of, of Christians. It's let's celebrate the diversity in the body of Christ. Let's show how uh, there are strengths in all these different facets of Christianity. And kind of like you were saying about the differences in the prayer across different parts of the world, there's value in that, there's power in that, but let's look at it and make sure that we're testing everything and we're, we're making sure that what we are experiencing, how we are worshiping, how we are believing, how we are reading and interpreting scripture is accurate and and truth is at the foundation of all of that. And I just thought that was so well balanced. And, and I love that about this book. <laughs> That's Thank one of my, you. Yeah. Um, you know, I was going to tell you that uh, Publishers Weekly did a review of my book, which is huge because they get hundreds and hundreds a day. And I was like so thankful. Um, but what they said is this, the four camps that I describe, and then, you know, I kind of unpack these four camps of Christians is sort of like the equivalent of the modern day Enneagram, you know, the Christian version of the Enneagram, which is a hugely popular tool right now for right. figuring out, you know, what, what's my personality, personality like, et cetera. Types. types. Yeah, exactly. So the categories are, the categories are not conclusive. Never. They're never, they're never exactly right. on, but they are helpful structures, I think. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I saw elements of myself in multiple, I, oh, yeah. I, you know, and so I just thought it was very insightful and thank you, but I felt like it celebrated, um, what I came away with was not a, this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. It was let's, let's celebrate the diversity of the body of Christ and let's play to our strengths and, and embrace that and not try to stuff everybody into a box. Right. Don't be afraid to, and, and you give an anecdote in the book. I'm kind of digressing from what I wanted to talk about, but that's okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I, I feel like uh, in the book, you, you give an example of going to a worship gathering where people were worshiping in a different way than you were used to, or that you had been brought up in. And the thing that you said to God was, well, this is different, but if this is of you, I want it. I want yes. more of you in whatever way that looks. So God, if this is of you, I want it. And um, I thought that was a really, <clears throat> excuse me, a really telling, um, I don't know. It was just a very, a great example of how we can approach worship, how we can approach prayer, kind of that scripture that talks about, um, you know, don't treat prophecies with contempt, but test everything. Yes. Don't, don't treat these different types of worship with contempt. Yes, test it. Make sure that it's biblical. Make sure it's scriptural. Look at the fruit. Look at all of these things. Yes, Jamie. But, but don't treat it with contempt right off the bat. Well said. Well said. I think that's exactly right. And I think that we would do well. Again, uh, the, actually, the Hallmark Channel had me out um, into LA to uh, interview me on this book as well. Another honor, great honor. And um, they really picked up on that inclusion that I talk about in the book. And it really is about the four camps because I'm looking, you know, the whole point of the book is to say, here, here's, here's an issue I'm seeing in the church after decades of being a leader in the church. Um, I am seeing these four camps of Christians that are reacting to each other and picking mm -hmm. on each other and separated and divided and nasty. Heck, that's just within the body of Christ. And then we have all these people, Christians, non-Christians, looking and going, if that's what it means to be a Christian, A, people are saying, I'm out. Right. I don't want this brand of Christianity. Um, and then you have the world looking at us going, if that's what it means to be a Christian, no thanks. So we, we have to look at this. This is a critical, critical time in history, a critical time in the body of Christ, a critical time to understand. Do you recognize that, there, that the church is in decline in North America, in the West in general? And this is not a time to be divided. This is not a time to be divisive and to be nasty and picking on our brothers and sisters. It's a time for us, and that's what I was hoping to do, certainly with the, um, with the camps, is to say, you know, you make no Christians like this. You may know Christians like this. And we're all, we've got our strengths and our weaknesses, as mm -hmm. you said. And, um, 
And in some form or fashion, all four of the camps, you know, the camps are the untapped, the ones that feel like lowly worms all the time. Um, they have their strengths, though, and their weaknesses. Um, there's the, uh, the truth protectors. They're the ones that are like the Christian police. Then we have the um, keeping it real that are like, you know what, I'll take Jesus, but mm, obedience, submission to his will, mm, not so much. And then we've got the, um, and again, let me say, strengths and weaknesses in both in 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 um, all cases and then the final one is the hashtag blessed that says it's basically the prosperity theology come to jesus you'll be healthy wealthy you'll have everything basically it's the american dream on steroids in jesus name and we've got these four camps but it's not like they're stupid it's not like it's unfounded they they've gotten these things from scripture they love god they want god and somehow the good news has gotten dampered. It's gotten uh, dismantled. It's gotten distorted. And it has us divided and picking on each other. And that's a problem. Now, I define the problem in the beginning of the book and the rest of the book I spend equipping us to like, come on, come alive. Let's figure this out together. Yes. So, but I do think it's critical for, for, I think you make an excellent point, Jamie, in saying, um, in saying that you do not want to, t to treat these things with this, this judgy kind of sarcastic, uh, uh, punchy, um contempt i think it's i think we really need to pull back and go wait a minute could this be god could god be like that though i know nothing of him that way could he be could he she be <laughs> you know god is god is uh god is much bigger than we realize absolutely well, I pro can I just say for a second, the only yeah. reason I had said he, she, I, for those listeners who are going, oh, what did she say? <laughs> I just want to say this. Well, men and women are created in the image of God. God is father. Jesus is masculine. I don't want people to get tripped up by my saying that. The word pneuma for the Holy Spirit is a feminine word. God is both male and female. We were created in his image. What, how that all gets played out, I have no idea. But I will say that I do, I do pray in the, uh, in the masculine. <laughs> yes. No, I, I totally get that too. We did a, um, a series, a video series called Gratitude from A to Z, where we gave thanks for things that God didn't have to give us, but did anyway. And one of the things for the letter Y was, you know, I could have, I guess, given thanks for yaks or no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It was why it was for, you know, um, what are some other things? Yetis? I don't know, but I chose the Y chromosome because God ah. did. God equipped, you know, he could have made us all one gender, but he equipped Adam with both the X and the Y chromosome. And, and it said male and female, he created them so that he could be genetically taken from that so yeah i totally get that yeah pneuma <laughs> is the word for the holy spirit the spirit right and i just think that's interesting and i think it it's is. not you know i think it's worth us just paying attention to slightly <laughs> yes well you um you talked a little bit about these four camps and so can you just kind of expound a little bit on maybe the strengths and weaknesses that you see would that be too much to go through that like just very briefly or should we leave it to our listeners to read the book to find that out well i can actually because i in my book um i there are definitely i'll, I'll give you a couple just to help you sort of get your your just head around yeah. yeah to get your head around uh you know who these people are um, and so for, in the book, in fact, in fact, for each of the four camps, I give it, I give a chapter to each of the camps and helpfully help explain through stories and personal experiences, et cetera, mm -hmm. in scripture, how they get to that place of being in that particular camp, the untapped, for example. Then at the end, I give a summary. So let me just read a little bit. Um, so the untapped, in a nutshell, um, the untapped have, have great strengths, of course, listening is one of them. Again, these are the ones who are sort of, I'm a wretch, don't expect much from me. Um, wisdom deep wisdom comes from this particular group. Um, and they also have this chronic feeling of unworthiness, or they can have uh, depressive or negative thoughts. Um, 
a lot of times I've heard the untapped camp say people, people from that camp, I should say, say things like, I knew you were somebody. Um, everyone wants to be around you. I could just tell that this was so about you. Mm. And the subtext is nobody wants to be with me. And so there's this, this nagging sort of, um, you know, sadness about that, then um, of this unworthiness. So that's that one camp, the untapped. Now then there's the truth protectors, which I've defined as, uh, as sort of the Christian police. They're the ones who are checking your podcast, Jamie, and going, uh, what version of scripture is she using? And what <laughs> denominational background? And did, did she just say God could be a she? Those are the <laughs> protectors, right? And we yeah. need them. We need the full body of Christ. Yes. Um, and so uh, truth protectors can have high integrity. They value knowledge. Um, they can be very hard on themselves and others, critical and correcting. <laughs> they are often our teachers and our pastors, you know, and I have, and I confess in the book, I am a recovering truth protector. Yes. I mean, it's my bent. That's I love your stories. I love the stories of your childhood <laughs> that you draw out uh, about <gasps> being a truth protector. That was really oh. Oh, I have a thousand of them. You know, when you write a book, <laughs> you're like, okay, we better, we better edit and make sure we just give a couple. But I have so many. I'm, I'm sad to say, you know, uh, the strengths part of being a truth protector, um, your leadership and your, um, and uh, the high integrity and the valuing knowledge and commitment to justice and righteousness. These are great mm -hmm. things, but they can get misapplied. Mm -hmm. Um, then the keeping it reels, you know, they're the ones, and I use Bonhoeffer's um, cheap grace. He talks about that, you know, it's the, it's grace without discipleship. Mm. And um, so in the keeping it reels, um, they're the camp that can be characterized as acting free. Like I'm all free. They're smiling and they're kind of condescending to those who are still being goody two shoes. You know, you're still abiding by the rules, you legalists, that kind of mm. thing. Um, they're often looking at the truth protectors. Um, they can be defined as people who are just full of beautiful grace. And it's not only cheap grace. They really do understand grace as well. Mm -hmm. So again, this is the balance of the, of the strengths and the weaknesses. Sometimes the keeping it reals are like, I don't need this. I can be a Christian without Christians. So they're the ones who are who can often say, um, I can get my Christian teaching from podcasts and, and YouTube. I can listen to any great preacher I want to. I do not have to go to be with the people of God. No thanks. So sometimes the keeping it reels can can be those people. Then finally the hashtag blessed. Hashtag blessed is that what I call the prosperity theology. Um, all of these groups and, and what I call camps, by the way, are found, they get where they are based on scripture, based on the worship songs that we sing. They're not, they're not out in left field. It's founded on something. Mm -hmm. So the hashtag blessed have great strengths. Some of their strengths are freedom. They have a beautiful freedom. Um, they have a beautiful faith. You know, they're like, take the hill, let's go, believe God for that. I just love it. Um, they have a lot of joy often, the hashtag blessed. Um, but also with that group, they can say things like, we have the full gospel. Meaning you guys are really not quite getting it, but we get it all. We really understand it all. Um, a lot of times... Um, there can be uh, an awareness and experience. Oh, this is a good thing. An awareness and a heal and experience of healing gifts, which is fabulous. We want that. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes there's a communication that if things don't work out the way you've prayed by faith, then something's wrong with you. Something's mm -hmm. wrong with your faith. So mm -hmm. this can get into a little bit of a basically demanding of God pray it forth, speak it into the atmosphere, God will make it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Jesus has a lot to say about that. So those, again, strengths and weaknesses on both sides. We want to be careful not to be camping out in the ditch of any of these, but we want to embrace the, you know, these camps for their good things, for their good, uh, for their strengths and, uh, and be the full body of Christ to exalt him um, and to truly, um, live that's the book right meant to live to come alive as the full body of christ yes and i love that i just think in this age of division and finger pointing it's it's just so important to 
recognize the strengths and the diversity without sacrificing the truth. And that's a tough line yes. to walk. <laughs> but it is. But this book really, I would, I would just really recommend that our listeners, if you have any conflicts within the body of Christ that you're experiencing, or if you just want to get to know yourself a little bit better, because I just, I learned a lot about myself and some of the anecdotes awesome. that you shared, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm in that camp sometimes too, you know, and I just, I think it's great. So I, yeah. I definitely recommend that because I feel like it really will build unity and just a mentality of looking at people with God glasses, being able to see them the way God sees them in the fullness of truth, but with love and uh, desire for moving forward and, and working toward a common goal. Completely. I agree. Well, one really, really neat story that you shared that I'd like you to talk about is your mom at the end of her life um, mm. and the power of blessing when she gave you the gift of blessing, just kind of like in that Old Testament blessing. Yes. Yeah. Can you share that story and, and just tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. You know, I, um, my mother was a, a very key figure in my life, as most mothers are. <laughs> and, uh, and, and a little of the backstory is that she raised her three girls. My father left when I was a little girl. He was abusive um, in every way, physically, verbally, spiritually, emotionally, um, and then took everything and left. So my mom raised us. She was a new believer at the time, by the way, maybe two years in. And she just was a woman of great faith. And she loved her girls, like passionately loved her girls and taught us to follow hard after God, love him, follow him, trust him, um, which I will be forever grateful for. Now, she's also, she was also one of my biggest cheerleaders. And uh, my mother was the kind of woman, like really awesome, um, fun woman, you know, kick her shoes off, have a, have a great time. Um, very honest, uh, lots of fun. She was uh, also the kind of woman who could speak her mind. <laughs> and so um, when I, I remember when I, so my background, Jamie, first of all, back in Canada, I started as a singer. I got my first degree in voice performance from the University of Toronto. All my life, I just wanted to sing. And I was singing. I was doing concert work and lots of Christian work all throughout Canada and also the musical theater. My mother celebrated got behind all of my singing. I mean, that woman was a huge cheerleader. <clears throat> when we moved, my husband Cam, I've been married almost 30 years, 29 years. And then we have these two boys, David and Aaron. Now we have a daughter-in-law, but at the time, um, so this was 20 years ago, we moved from Canada to the US. And and um, I couldn't actually work because I didn't have a visa. My husband, we moved for his job. And, <clears throat> and as it turned out anyway, I remember just really struggling because at the time I was doing a lot of musical theater and that's eight shows a week. Matinee evening, matinee evening on the weekend. So it was really eating up the family time. My mother was there supporting me. She would come and she would help look after the boys with a cam. And, but I was really sort of thinking, God, do you want me to step away from this for a time? But it was hard for me, but I did. Then we moved to the US and I couldn't work anyway. So I was at home for a couple of years with my boys. Um, and then I started praying, God, I, I really wanna get back on the stage, like I'm ready. Is it okay with you? Anyway, long story short, this is another story for another time, but it became evident to me that God wanted to move me into television with QVC. That's a whole other story. Um, through prayer, through journaling, through discerning God saying, honey, I'm not letting you go back on the stage in this way, but I am going to refine you and train you in another area. So he puts me in television. Okay. When I started with QVC, my mother said to me, uh-uh this is not you. And I was like, mom, this is a great opportunity. It's a great company. You don't know anything about it, but let me tell you about it. Let me take you there. Let me show you on air. And um, I did win her over because, you know, QVC is like a, an animal, right? It's the world's largest multi-platform retailer. Like it's a mammoth thing. <clears throat> and so, but at first my, but my mother was still, even though she saw all that and she liked that, she was like, mm -mm. This is not what God is doing, but I respect where you are right now. 
And I'm just telling you, this is not it. And I knew, but I loved what I was doing and I didn't think I was being disobedient. I really believed I was still following God. Now fast forward 10 and a half years and uh, working on air with QVC and I hear the Lord's call and I decide to go to seminary to get equipped to fulfill the calling. So while I was in seminary, I think it was my first, maybe my second year in seminary, um, we had just been in Toronto and just celebrated my mom's 80th birthday. My sisters and I threw this big celebration for her back in Toronto. So um, a week later, I um, get a call from one of my sisters. It wasn't even a week later, actually. It was just, no, it was a week later, sorry. My, my sister called and said, <clears throat> mom's gone into the hospital um, with a gallstone. She went into emergency. Um, is she okay? Do I need to come? Nope, you don't need to come, Nancy. Remember, I'm in Philadelphia. You don't need to come. You're good. We've got it covered. Okay, fine. So a couple of days go by, and then it becomes clear to me, mom's not getting well, and they're not able to treat this whole gallstone. So I, um, I end up getting to Toronto, and I'm sitting at the bedside of my mother, and it becomes abundantly clear that my mom uh, is going to die. Now, <laughs> she was perfectly healthy two weeks earlier and strong and beautiful. And here we are a week later and the doctors have said, she's not going to live. We have to take all life support away. Mm -hmm. And she has maybe 12 hours to live. Wow. And uh, my mother said she was still clear, though she was on some medication to keep her very calm and still, so she didn't act like my mother, <clears throat> but she was still clear-minded. And she said, I want to speak with each of my three girls one by one. Mm -hmm. And when I went in and sat at the side of my mother's uh, hospital bed, and she took my hand and she looked at me, and one of the things she said, she said a few things to me, five things that I noted um, that were critical. And the first thing she'd said was, my baby, which was really precious. But the, the very, the really critical thing that my mother said to me that day, which I will never forget, she looked at me and she said, Nancy, God's calling on your life is to be a Christian speaker, to proclaim him. You, this is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And I've known it all along. This is it. Don't turn away. Don't turn back. Keep going. Do this thing. And I'm, I am telling you, Jamie, it was like, you know, like Joseph putting his hand, the patriarchal hand on the daughter, on the child, and praying out that prophetic word. Prophetic prophecy simply means truth. That prophetic word over one's life, in this case, my mother, over my life, looking me in the eyes, her final words to me, child, this is it. QVC was a stepping stone for you, but this is what God has made and created and called you for and to be. Do not shrink back go. And she blessed me that day. I am telling you what an impact. And it's held me through these last four years as I've been building the ministry. Beautiful impact from a mother to her daughter, her that, baby. Oh, that is amazing. And I mean, so how can you see us in our daily lives living this out and, and being more aware of the power of blessing in, in our day to day? Jamie, I devote a whole chapter to blessing. I think, I think it is highly underrated. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think we understand the power of releasing the vision, releasing the, the, the blessing, releasing the prophetic word over anyone in front of our faces. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my voice right now, you know, this is spirit and life, our words, right? Our spirit and life. Mm -hmm. My words, your words are going out through the airwaves right now. And I pray blessing on them to whoever's listening. Um, I think that whether it's our children, whether it's a nasty neighbor, whether it's our pastor, God have mercy on our churches that are so hard on our leaders and our pastors. Mm -hmm. We need to be people who affirm them affirm them and quit tripping over what they're not and affirm them for who they are and what they're doing well. 
Um, so I think uh, it's not just people who um, enjoy words of affirmation that need to be affirmed. And it's not praise junkies. And it's not uh, people who, um, uh, you know, we, we, I'll just say, we need to exercise far more frequently the positive words that God has given that we can see in a person. I will say, um, with my son David right now, you know, we have two boys. Um, and I remember uh, I, I said to David, David, oh, it is so clear to me. When he was a little boy, he was so judgmental. He was so uh, about righteousness. And I was like, child. And sure, there were times I'm like, you judgy little thing. Sure, I felt <laughs> that way. <laughs> you know, kids. But I also remember thinking, ah, he's exercising the flip side of his gifting right now. That child has, a, has, has an ability to judge, mm -hmm. like, well, and to have good judgment and wants righteousness. These are good qualities. And then I, I have say, one of those too. Do you? <laughs> I do. Right. So we want to affirm them. We want to say, David, I see this in you. And I gave him the verse from Micah. What does the Lord require of you, David? I call him David, David, the, to act justly, child, to love mercy. That will soften the judgy part, right? To love mercy. Here's another thing that oh, will soften like that. the righteousness and the justice piece, the, you know, the, the judgy, not the justice. We want justice, but the judgy part of the justice. The other part that will soften it is to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Those parts will soften and temper and refine the gifting. So I want to speak it over my kid. I want to say, I see this in you. Now, the kid's in law school right now, interestingly, um, you know, and I think those are the ways that we craft and hone and train up the child in the way the child should go. They won't depart from it as we breathe out the prophecy, as we breathe out, out, out the, uh, the blessing over the kid or our spouse, by the way. <laughs> Don't forget, because sometimes they're the ones that'll just, they'll just, I'll tell you, the way we can interact with our spouses, we have the choice at any moment to bless them or to curse them, to cut them off at the knees or to lift them high again. Like we, we have the power to do this. So I think taking a moment, pausing, praying, God, I have nothing good to offer this person right now, but you in me does. Would you pour out truth right now on, uh, through me to this person? If you would give me something, that'd be great. Sometimes God doesn't, sometimes he does. So zip it or speak it out in a way that will bring life, not death. Amen. Oh, I love that. I just, I want my, I want my kids to be here right now so I can go bless them. Yes. <laughs> this is really right? an inspiration. And I know. Yeah. But I love that you in the book really make a distinction between, we're not talking about praising them like crazy just for the sake of praising, not to, not to build up. I think you even said it a few minutes ago, praise junkies. We don't want right. to do that. We want to, it to be authentic truth. Not yes. For the sake of saying it. And oh, that is so powerful. Oh, oh, I love it. oh love it. thank you. It is powerful. It releases yeah. power. It really, listen, don't you think the world's a wreck? I mean, there's enough <laughs> junk going on. Your kids are going to go off to school, whether it's a homeschool situation, they're still in a school that's they're going to get, or they're going to Christian school. I don't care. Or they're going to be in a public school or a private school where you're paying 40000 a year. It doesn't matter. They're going to walk down the street they're going to get a barrage of negativity and a barrage of chopping them down at the knees and telling them who they are and defining them. If we, as their parent, if we, as sisters and brothers in Christ, can't, can't take the, the bull by the horns and speak life into the very people God has entrusted to us, has put in front of our very faces, if we can't do that, I, I don't know what we're here for. I don't know what we're doing. No, I, I love that. And our husbands too, that, that definitely, they can fall through the cracks very much so. Oh yeah. 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 Actually, can I tell you, Cam and I, my husband had a fight right before he left. He left from Madrid yesterday. So this is real time, Jamie. Nobody else has this in their recording because it just happened. Oh no. <laughs> no, it happened. I mean, Cam and I are passionate about each other. We've been married 29 years by the grace of God, by the, uh, you know, to God's glory through counseling along the way, we've got a thriving, vital, fabulous marriage. We do. 
and we have our issues. And so right before he left for Madrid yesterday, I mean, we had had a really, really, really tense weekend. And I can tell you, because this is a podcast about prayer, I can tell you, I spent a heck of a lot of time saying, God, help me to see my husband's soul right now. Help me not to jump on words that would trigger me Mm -hmm. or to get caught into some pattern that takes us down, but to be still. And, And one of the things I had prayed before I even prayed this was, Lord, help me to remember That no matter if Cam never loves me the way I want him to love me, you do. Uh, My my identity, I am is established in my being the beloved. I am loved by you. I am cherished. I am grounded in you. That actually set up the whole rest of the conversation, and then I was able to release it and go, God, now how do I see my husband here? How do I respond here? Did I do it perfectly? No, but it was the um, wind that I was traveling on through our conversation. And we were able to embrace and to text each other very loving words while he was uh, headed to the airport. (laughs) That's the truth. (laughs) Oh, and that is, you know, I think that's what it's all about. It's never going to be perfect, but when we are aware and inviting God into these moments, into these relationships, into these troubles. Just it's, I think prayer is about just inviting God into everything and, yes. you know, in the moment by moment and, and it makes everything better. It makes everything better. Not perfect, but because yeah. we're still imperfect, but it just, like you said, I like that wind analogy where it's the wind that carried that, interaction and yes that is. yeah that's exactly what it is yes yes well I could just have you on here for a whole other hour but we're <laughs> running out of time and so I just um I just want to ask what uh, how listeners can find you online can connect with you can find your book where where can we find you Well, you can find me uh, in three main ways, Uh, Instagram and Facebook, Nancy Hicks Live. I'm on all the time and love to interact with people. Um, My website, nancyhickslive.com, and uh, there's lots of good resources for people there. So please jump on there and uh, and take whatever's there and use it for ministry. Um, Use it for your personal personal devotional life, whatever. Use it with a friend, a neighbor. And then also, I will say that certainly you can pick up the book at Amazon. You'll see on my website various ways that you can purchase, you know, Barnes and Noble, et cetera. But the easiest way people have gotten them, um, except when I show up to speak at an event, I always have my books and I love to sign them. But but certainly go to Amazon.com, Meant to Live, Living in Light of the Good News by Nancy Hicks, and, and just grab a copy. And I'd love to hear from your listeners. So thank you for asking, Jamie. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. This has been wonderful. And your book is just wonderful. I'm excited to just see you moving forward and maybe another book in the works. Do you think you have another one? Oh Another yeah. One in you? More? yeah. I have one in the works. In fact, right now we're going to honor Meant to Live. I have an audio version of Meant to Live coming out at the end of February, which is awesome. And you're recording I'm, that. You're recording. I'm that recording. I, I'm my own voice because I have a background in performance. Yes, I love it. Oh, I I'm can't doing wait. it. Oh, I can't. Thank you. And then, uh, and then we've got some other goodies that we're developing for Meant to Live over the course of this next year. But. In addition to that, I am working on the proposal, the book proposal for another book, which I'm very excited about. And I've got a few more up my sleeve after that. But the next one is about the uh, uh, sex abuse story um, that we suffered in the church. Not that it happened, but how we handled it when it did. So I'm really excited. And there's been a lot of uh, questioning of me around that and how uh, this is the thing, you know, when you have a son, for example, like we have that was sexually abused in the church. Right now, our other son, our older one is going through, has gone through chemotherapy for colon cancer. He's 27. Uh, uh, What I say through the book Meant to Live is if, if what I have written in this book isn't true when life is hitting you in hard, And when the church isn't responding and people aren't loving you, if it's not true in those times, then the words of this book aren't true at all, but they are. 
They mm -hmm. are true in the hard times and in the joyous times. God is always calling to us, come and live. It's just the truth. Amen. Well, how can we pray for you today? We're going to end and I'm going to just close us out with prayer. So how can we be praying for you today? And your, I was going to ask about your son because I knew that he oh, was going through you. chemo. Um, and just how can we be praying for you professionally, personally, ministry, everything? Oh gosh. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Um, well, I will say yes for my son, David. He's the one that's in law school right now up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, he's just finished uh, 12 rounds of chemotherapy for colon cancer. And now we have those five years, that five-year window where he'll get checked all the time to see if it comes back. And so that's an obvious one. Mm -hmm. um, the ministry, I will say, I, my big prayer is that I would hear the voice of the Lord and continue to follow faithfully, faithfully follow where he leads. Um, and I, I really am um, asking God to open more doors for me to speak because I'm going to be in Haiti soon and Nigeria and Uganda and Ethiopia this summer. But I, and I have lots of speaking uh, opportunities coming, but I want more. I have high capacity. So I would love to come to churches and do conferences and retreats and more of those kinds of things. So um, that's a, those are the ways to pray. And if you think of me and pray for me, I'd be so grateful, truly, and your listeners too. All right. Well, let's pray. Thank you. Father, we just thank you so much for this time. God, I just thank you for Nancy. I thank you for the journey that you have brought her on to get to this point of just living out that destiny that you had planned for her before the foundations of the earth, God. And it's, it's not finished. There's just so much more ahead. I just pray that you would continue to give her very clear vision I pray that you would allow her to hear your voice so clearly, just high above all of the other noise swirling around. Um, Lord, I pray that she would have um, very specific uh, targeted vision for the, the next steps for her, Lord. I'm, I'm sure she has a lot of different things going on. Give her just ordered next steps to be able to prioritize the things that are important to you. Um, Lord, I just thank you for her heart and just her passion for calling us as a church to live out our lives in light of the good news, Father, that that darkness would be overshadowed by the light of the good news. I just pray that, God, that you would just pour out your spirit on the church in the United States, Amen. in Canada, North America, South America, the whole world, God, yes. that the body of Christ would be just illuminated that that we would not be in the shadows of judgment and and criticism um, toward each other that we would be unified and raised up to just bring your heavenly purposes on earth as it is in heaven mm -hmm. i pray for david lord we lift him up we thank you that he's nearing the end of these treatments and just pray god for your healing hand that you would unleash healing power in his life that he would be able to have just totally clear uh, scans and that he would be completely healed from cancer. Um, we pray for Nancy's entire family, God, for her marriage, for her children, for her daughter-in-law and their family, and um, just ask that you would rain down blessing on them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Oh, great speaking with you, really.